in the chat box and we'll see what we can do to correct it. So it looks like it's uh, right on time to start. Uh, normally we hang out for just a couple of minutes to allow some stragglers to come through. Uh, so I'll probably go through my first couple slides just a little bit uh, slowly. Uh, and uh, Angela already talked about my background, uh, so I won't re rehash that. Um, uh, she mentioned I do have a book that came out uh, less than a year ago called uh, Accelerate. It's all about the convergence of search, social, and content marketing, which is why everybody here is on the webinar today. Of course, this has become a very hot topic uh, since the latest rollouts of uh, Panda and Penguin from Google. And if you haven't heard of those updates, uh, we can certainly talk about that on the side. I might cover it a little bit throughout the presentation, uh, but that's, that's more or less a, a different topic than what I'm going to address today. But, uh, but what those have done is really brought to the forefront uh, the critical need for uh, uh, high quality, engaging, fun, informational content. Uh, and that's what I'm going to step through today. I've got nine different examples that I think almost any business uh, can implement uh, you know, from, from a strategic and a development standpoint uh, with your content. So at Vertical Measures, we've uh, laid out eight different steps, uh, and it actually came about when I was putting together the book uh, last year. Um, it really, uh, writing a book uh, really helped me for, uh, force me into thinking through the various steps and how we move uh, with a client throughout our processes here at Vertical Measures. And so generally, it always starts with a strategy. Uh, sometimes our clients feel like they have a pretty good strategy in place, so uh, maybe we move into the research or the actual development stage. But pretty much, this is a continuous loop. You do your strategy, research, create the content, certainly optimized content, uh, promote it, distribute it, maybe build links to it, and then always, always be measuring your results. Um, you know, know what your benchmarks are, know what your goals are, measure, and then and keep improving. So uh, why focus on search? Um, you know, and that's primarily what I'm going to talk about today. And the reason is, and, and, and the, the, if you can see the uh, eye tracking uh, study that's on the left-hand part of this slide, you know, this has been out for years. In fact, this, this screenshot that I grabbed, it, it could be two years old. I've seen lots of recent ones. I've seen older ones. They all look extremely similar. And, and the kind of thing you're looking at here, it applies not only in search results, but it actually applies on web pages and content. So keep that in mind. People generally tend to look to the top left. And that's what this is implying here or indicating here, that, uh, that the colors show where someone looks on a Google search results page. And it doesn't surprise anyone on the call, most likely. Uh, everybody looks to the top left and certainly the top two or three results. And I'm going to get more granular about this near the end of, of today's webinar. Anyway, so focusing on search, what I was talking about was the purple X is where, is where people tend to click when they come up with search results. And so everybody, you know, just like you do and you're normal searching on Google and Bing and whatever, uh, you tend to click on the top two, three search results. Very few people amazingly click on the ads. And the reason I say amazingly is that is Google's business model is how they derive, you know, their revenue. And they derive it on a small percentage of the searches. So some of the stats are that 93% of all buyers online or in-store use search prior to making a purchase. And 86% of those searchers conduct non-branded queries, meaning you know, they're not searching for vertical measures or Zappos or Amazon or whatever. They're searching for a non-branded kind of search terms. And then as I've already uh, kind of covered there, 94% of the buyers uh, click on the organic links versus the paid links. So what I'm really here to talk about is a bunch of different ideas to help you cover as many of the, the organic search results as possible. And universal search results were rolled out by Google maybe, maybe now three years ago. So it's nothing really new, but they keep getting uh, more and more universal as the uh, months and the quarters and the years roll by. Uh, this was a study done uh, about six months ago, I believe. Um, Actually, I see May down the bottom there, so it was almost a year ago already. But this shows how many different types of content now appear in Google's uh, search results. And in fact, if you notice on the bottom, 61% of all searches re uh, result in a universal search, search result. So blogs show up, maps, news, books, shopping, images, video. We've all seen it. And it's just getting more and more popular. And my recommendation throughout this presentation is to create a lot of different kinds of content 
to increase your odds of your content showing up in a different type of search results. So basically, people need content that makes them more informed before a purchase. And your organization, and any organization that provides that, will win. So let's get started. So the, the very first thing I wanted to address is pricing and cost. And, and, and this example comes from, uh, some, from somebody who uh, really highlighted this for me. I saw him speak about a year ago, uh, Marcus Sheridan, who built one of the largest pool uh, companies. Uh, they were on the brink of failing. And he went after content marketing and, and turned the business around primarily on producing content. And one of the first things he decided he needed to address is, is how much do fiberglass pools cost? And you can't quite tell here uh, uh, probably, but he owns the first two results uh, for that. Uh, he's, you know, it's, it's uh, river pools and spas. And his message and my message to you is you don't always have to give the exact price of things. You don't have to tell your consumers exactly what something costs. In a, in, a, in a services business like ours, it's very difficult to do anyway, but you need to address the situation. People are searching and they're typing in phrases just like that. How much does a fiberglass pool cost? How much does uh, content marketing services cost? Or you know, uh, so on and so forth. You, you get the picture. I highly recommend just creating blog posts and pages and you know, various pieces of content where you can address that issue in many different ways so that when people are doing that search, of course, you're found online. So don't be afraid of addressing uh, prices and costs. So the next thing that, that people search for a lot, and, and, and again, just think about how you search. You probably go off and you're going to buy a, a refrigerator or a television or, a, in this example, a software product. And sometimes you might literally say, uh, you know, whatever it is, software, you know, ABC comparison to XYZ. Um, uh, you might search for reviews. So I recommend looking at creating content, and even though this is going to bring your competitors onto a page on your website, it's okay, of course, as long as you compare favorably, uh, and create comparisons, create uh, reviews, and think about, again, how your searcher is going to search, and then create content that's going to get found, that answers that search for them, informs them, brings them to your page, and brings them one step closer to doing business with you. The third one is one of my favorites, uh, free guides or white papers. Uh, if, depending on, again, the kind of business that you're in, whether usually if you're in a B2B, this would apply, you know, business to business, this would apply to you. Maybe if you're in a services business where your, one of your key focuses is to drive leads from your website, and that's, you know, we, we do that here. So I recommend creating free guides, white papers, other really valuable pieces of information um, and give them away for free on your website. And all you would do, of course, is ask for their name and their email address. And I wouldn't ask for too much more than that. You're just trying to grow your list. You're trying to get leads. You're trying to see who, who is interested in your type of products or services and then start to nurture it from there. Uh, and for example, on the left there, we have, on our homepage, we feature a free content marketing guide that people can download. It gets downloaded every single day. We make it very simple for them to get. Um, and we, of course, develop a lead. They go into all of our marketing programs, newsletters, uh, you know, lead nurturing, so on and so forth. If you're in a more technical industry, maybe you're going to give out a white paper. It doesn't really matter what you call it. Just make sure it's got a lot of good value. It could be a, a video series, but make sure it's got a lot of good value for the person stopping by your websites to convince them that it's okay for them to give you some core information about them to get this free information from you. All right, number four, fairly easy to do as well, uh, interviews. Um, I do a lot of these. I do mostly now video interviews uh, where I'm either the person being interviewed or I'm the person uh, giving the, uh, 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 leading the interview. Um, and this is an example of, of a text-based interview I did a long time ago. In fact, if I can see the date correctly, it was about two years ago. But this is where somebody interviewed me on their website. The point is, what I recommend is reach out to experts in your field, see if they'll answer the way we've done it uh, in a text basis. We'll send them maybe 10 or 12 questions um, and ask them to answer as many as they're comfortable with. They send it back. You basically have a blog post then. I mean, hopefully you can use their headshot and, you know, and, and highlight the, the, the interviews, the different pieces of the interview. Uh, if it's a video, of course, you would embed the video. Uh, but what, what tends to happen now is by uh, you interviewing experts in your field, um, you become an expert. 
you look like an expert. Your website certainly looks like it's providing expert information, and it's fairly easy to do. Uh, it's all about planning when you're, when you're rolling out an interview series like this. Number five, uh, lists. People still love lists, and I'm sure all of you can relate to this as well. You know, if you're going on a, 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 a vacation, maybe you're going to look for the top things to do in uh, Hawaii. Um, you know, and, and you'll, you search for that, and you will find them. There will be people who say the top 12 things to do in Hawaii, the top 15 things. You know, here's, here's an example on uh, social mouths. Uh, you know, 15 blogs to follow if you want to kick ass online. Well, that was a very popular post. This was, I grabbed this screenshot a long time ago, and at that point I had 495 tweets, lots of people liking it, um, and, and uh, they just work really, really well. In fact, I will tell you that we did a study seeing what kinds of content got linked to the most, and one of the top pieces of content uh, that attracted the most backlinks to it is lists. All right, and similar to a list is curation or aggregation. Um, and this is a, a friend of ours, Christy Hines. She's got a great website called Kikolani. She does a lot uh, in social media and, and uh, uh, um, uh, blogging. And every Friday, she does Fetching Friday. And she lists all sorts of resources, and then she'll have some other topic. Like this happens to be an example of the Fit Desk. So she'll, you know, sometimes she'll list 100 resources. But what is really neat about doing curation is you'll notice here how she's linked out to these resources, given a quick summary, and then linked out to these resources. Well, if you're bloggers, you know that when someone links to your blog or your website, you generally get notified that someone's linked to you. And the whole kind of sharing thing starts to take place where you notice that, that this particular website linked to you. Maybe next time you're working on a post, you might return the favor write about them, link back to them. But curation can actually be a fairly fast way to create, to create a really powerful piece of content. And imagine if you, you came up with 100 sources for something, whatever your, your mashup or your aggregation turned out to be, and just imagine if only 20% of them, but 20% of those people got the you know, notification and linked back to you or tweeted about it or shared it on their Facebook page because you mentioned them. Well, suddenly, all of this is coming back to your website, to your web page. It can be pretty powerful. The seventh thing, this is a little bit tricky. Uh, you've got to be able to react quickly. Um, and this is to, to be, uh, the ability to be able to write about breaking news, trending topics. And you can go to Twitter, Yahoo, Google+, various places, uh, you know, just the news homepage, see what's happening right now. Uh, and then figure out a way for your market, your industry, your business uh, to take advantage of that. Uh, you can, you know, of course, do it in humorous ways. You could just do a, a, a roundup of today's trending topics, whatever it might be. Of course, the benefit is when things are breaking like this, people are searching for it. So it just might come across your content. The hard part is you've got to be able to react. You know, it just doesn't work to write about breaking news five days later. You've got to be able to, to react within hours and sometimes no more than 48 hours. It can be uh, easy to produce uh, if you can jump on it. And number eight is tell stories. And this is probably not as easy as some of the other things that I talked about because it does take a skill. Uh, but what you're looking at, of course, if you can see my screen, is the back of a business card of one of my friends, uh, Simon Kelly with Story Worldwide. He's a great guy, founded the company. Uh, and uh, I don't know where we were, a couple years ago, uh, he handed me his card. Oh, we were on a panel together, I remember, and he slid his card over to me. And uh, I flipped it over and saw this on the back of it, and, you know, I've never forgotten it. In fact, it's, it's tacked to the wall in my office because I look over it all the time to remind me that it's really all about stories. And as it says on the bottom of this particular slide, you know, stories more powerful than the brand, the best story wins. And it's really, really true. You know, people relate to stories. You can present facts and data and so on and so forth to people. You can you can hope that you're providing really good information about you know that that they're looking for. But if you can tell it in a story, some way that they can relate to it, it just becomes that much more powerful. All right. So we talked about a lot of different ways, a lot, a lot of different kinds, a lot of different ways to produce content. And I think all of you can produce. Everything that I talked about so far, um, you know, it, it, it's really a time and, and a resources commitment. It's not a huge cost factor. 
Uh, but where people tend to get stuck is, okay, I get it. I should, you know, I should talk about pricing. I should tell a story. I should uh, do a top ten list, or you know, whatever it is. But they tend to get hung up right in. But what do I write about? You know, and, and we hear a lot. Oh, I'm in a boring business, or you know, I'm in insurance. Or how do I? You know, I can't keep talking about that. But you can. And so my next few slides is to take a few minutes to talk about ways you can come up with content ideas that might fit any of those previous categories that I discussed. So of course, keyword research still is the foundation. Keyword research is not going to go away. I don't care how dominant social media might become in the future and uh, whatever's happening with search in the next uh, two, three, four years. People search for stuff, and they search by using keywords. So you want to know what kind of keyword phrases do your customers already use, and you can discover that by looking deeply into your analytics, or you use Google Analytics, or whatever platform you might use. Discover how people are actually already finding your website. But there are also a few other, and I'm just going to show you a couple of free, simple tools. Um, one of the things I used to recommend, and I actually still do, it's just it's really easy. Just go to Google's homepage, right, and you start to type in the key, your money phrases, you know, the keyword phrases that you think are the best phrases for, uh, to, to get business from your website. And you'll notice that the drop down happens, right? Google suggests starts to happen. So if you start to type in, my example here is hiking boots. I like to hike, so I use this example. So you type in hiking, and all of a sudden you see these things starting to drop down. And Google's suggesting search terms to you. Well, that's a great place to do research right there because Google's suggesting very similar things to the rest of the world. Um, and, and lots of people click on those. So they're good content ideas. And again, I'm talking about content idea generation here through keywords. But I discovered this site a, a while back called Suval that gives you not only the Google suggest, but it'll actually go out to many other websites and bring down similar lists. So the example you see here is I typed in uh, hiking boots and you'll see on Bing and on Amazon and on Yahoo all kinds of suggestions that those websites are, are, are giving when you do the searches on their site. So uh, with Amazon, you know, some of the basics, you know, there's a few of them there, uh, hiking boots for women, hiking boots, waterproof. Uh, but it gets a little more interesting under REI. When people go there, it's hiking boots salmon. You know, hiking boots Columbia, they're throwing in a little bit of a brand brand look there. So again, this is a way to generate uh, ideas um, uh, that you should start to collect. And so the process is start, you know, just look at your analytics, use a tool like Suitable, use a tool like Yahoo Answers, uh, Quora, LinkedIn, Answers.com, Facebook, go to sites like this and do the same kind of a search. And so the example here is Yahoo Answers. So I typed in, once again, hiking boots. And Yahoo Answers has millions of questions and answers that they've been collecting over the years. They get, I, I don't know how many they get a day. I mean, it's, it's tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of questions and answers there. And you can narrow your searches down. I just went into the general search, typed in hiking boots, and you'll notice that it brought back 1,600, 1,618 results around hiking boots. And so what I recommend you do here is see what, what questions people are asking. You know, there's a question down there, what hiking boots will be the easiest to break in? What are the best hiking boots made in America? How can I choose a good pair of hiking boots? And you should write content around those questions. And in fact, sometimes the, the title of your content could be that question. Because we all, we all do the same thing, right? These days, we all go to Google, you know, the source of all knowledge, of all information, and we type in a question. And we'll type in a full eight-word, ten-word question. You know, how old is Tom Cruise, or you know, whatever the question might be. And so, any post that's out there, or any content that actually has that question, it's highly likely it's going to rank highly, and people will click on it, and there they are at your website. One of, that's one of my favorites. So, something else you could do, and I hope you can follow along. I know it's a webinar, and I, we can't click live and all that, uh, or I'm not clicking live. Um, but here, here's another example that a lot of people don't know about. So you go to Google and you do your search. And in this particular case, I made a three-word search, waterproof hiking boots. And you, know, you get your normal search results. But on the left-hand side of Google search results, and I know they're move, moving this around, but right now it's still on the left-hand side. There's a more, I think it's a more button. Now you'll see like images and blogs and whatever, but there's a more button. Click on that. 
and it will drop down the list that you see now on the left where it starts with discussions and you click on discussions and you'll get search results back from Google where people are discussing the phrase waterproof hiking boots. And you can see, if you wanted to, you could narrow it down and say, I want to see discussions that are happening in the past 24 hours, past week, past year, uh, only forums, only Q&A sites, so on and so forth. But if you just look at this example, um, you know, the very first one is at askville.amazon. Uh, the next one is answers.walmart. So this is where people are on their webs on these kinds of websites asking and discussing waterproof hiking boots. Again, I would go there and I would get ideas for content you can create around waterproof hiking boots. And while you're there, you might as well participate in the conversation that's happening as well. Uh, that's just good branding for you. All right, so now you've maybe followed those three or four steps. You've got a whole list of content ideas. You've jotted down on paper, or maybe you're smart and you started right off the bat and started plugging them into a spreadsheet. And that's what I recommend. Start gathering ideas. Start grouping them. You know, I'm going to just keep using hiking boots. So if you're in the in the in the outdoors uh, uh, business, so maybe you've got uh, a section on hiking boots, a section on canoeing, you know, so on and so forth. And you just start gathering uh, ideas and laying them out in a spreadsheet. You know, possible titles, what kind of content you might create, uh, search engine. Uh, I'm sorry, keyword phrases that you want to make sure are included in this content, so on and so forth. You gather all these ideas and then put together your content calendar, your editorial calendar. And one of the ways you might think about that is, is in fact, we just did that here at Vertical Measures, is we just laid out our, our editorial calendar for the rest of the year. And we've, uh, you know, I think in July, we're cleverly calling it Content Marketing Month here. I think the next month is social media. Uh, September is planning for 2013. And so we've just kind of laid these general themes out per month. And then based on the resources you have available, and I realize there's people on this call that are small businesses and some are, are mega businesses, and you all have different resources and different time uh, that you can allocate to, to content. But based on that, you could lay out like this 173421 plan where you say, you know, daily I'm going to tweet about content on our site and content on other people's sites. Uh, weekly, I, I might be able to produce a newsletter. Uh, maybe every month, like we do here, you can do a webinar which you're participating in. Maybe quarterly, we could produce a free down, you know, download, you know, free ebook or uh, you know, a, a, an online magazine or a, a white paper, uh, and so on and so forth. So you, you get the idea. Just lay out what you can handle. Uh, and at Vertical Measures, our goal, we do two blog posts a month. One of them is text-based and one of them is video-based. Uh, you know, we do a lot of tweeting. We, do, uh, we try every 90 days to produce a new big piece of content. We also do a lot of infographics. We lay that into our schedule. So do the same thing. But plan out so that the staff that's going to help you with this or if you're going to outsource it, work with your outsourcing vendor and, and have a plan that's pretty forward-looking. All right, and if you were paying attention, I was gonna, I, at the very beginning I said I was going to talk about nine different content ideas that you can all do. So far I covered eight, and here's the ninth one. Uh, and I kind of saved this for last because I, uh, you know, I think it's finally, finally the era for videos. It's just getting so darn easy. Uh, you know, there's new products coming out that you can use. Uh, do great videos right inside of Facebook. Uh, of course, uh, Google Plus now with their Hangout feature, which we use a lot. Um, if you do uh, go to meeting, you can do webinars like go to meeting. Of course, you've always been able to do it with Skype, uh, and that, that's online videos where you have somebody else involved, let alone just taking out your your small video camera or setting up a small studio in your office or whatever it might be. And, and right here is just three examples of pretty easy to produce video. Uh, and the one on the top left, that's Jay Bear. I don't know. If, uh, in fact, I think he's doing a webinar, Opposing Mind, right now. We're competing. But uh, he and I did a webinar uh, just like this uh, quite a while ago when his book, uh, The Now Revolution, came out. Uh, uh, we had a, uh, a very successful, uh, well-done webinar. And we saved it, just like we're going to do for this one. Uh, and, it turned it, and we turned it into a video. And we post that video in our YouTube channel and on our website. So we, there's two things we just did. We produced content via a webinar, turned it into a, and repurposed it for a video. On the right, uh, when my book came out, Jay returned the favor and got a hold of me. We actually, I think this was a Skype video. Um, and uh, if I look here, the length of this video was 17 minutes. And I remember right in the beginning, we had some technical difficulties when we were doing the video. But all total, I think we spent maybe 25, 30 minutes together 
uh, I was in my office. He was in his office in Indiana. Well, we did the uh, did the video. He saved it. He edited it and added some graphics. I think he told me it took him 30 to minutes to maybe an hour. So now we've got two man hours wrapped up in creating this piece of content. He even had it transcribed, posted it on his website, and this is an old screenshot where it had, at that point had 278 uh, tweets, 21 uh, Google One Pluses. It was shared on LinkedIn, liked on Facebook, uh, and all of that was two man hours worth of work. Um, so it can be fairly easy. And then on the bottom, I won't go into this whole story, but we do a lot of link building at Vertical Measures. And the, the video here was uh, we give out an award each month for the best link that we got for our clients. And these two guys happened to tie, and one of them challenged the other one to a foot race in our parking lot. So two or three people grabbed their uh, flip videos, their phones, or whatever, went out and filmed it. And it's still on our website. And it, it may have a 1,000 views. I don't even know. I haven't looked for quite a long time. But right there, we produced a really uh, funny piece of content that told a story about vertical measures. And I think all told, we probably had a whole hour wrapped up in getting that video shot and posted on our, on our website. So and some of the reasons you want to consider video, I finally found some stats about say, uh, what it does for sales. And I've actually, I'm getting ready to speak at a conversion conference uh, in about two weeks. And, and I don't have them in this particular slide, but there's some really compelling recent research to show how well video helps convert people to a sale. So here's just three quick bullets. Uh, websites with videos sell 45% more stuff. Uh, customers who watch product videos are 85% more likely to buy, and probably you can relate to that as well. Uh, however, the attention, uh, average attention span is generally around 60 seconds. And in fact, I believe you have about 10 to 12 seconds uh, to get somebody's attention to get them to hang on for that 60 seconds. And then they're going to make another determination at, at around the 60 second mark whether they're going to be willing to continue and watch the rest of, of, of whatever it is that you're uh, demonstrating, showing, talking about, so on and so forth. And we're in the home stretch here. So, Long tail is the key. If you remember my very first slide, that heat map that showed everybody's clicking and, and looking at the top few search results. Well, here's real data that backs that up. And the reason I'm bringing it up is I know it's very, very tempting for people to go after what we call the head terms. And we call that, you know, the two or three word uh, keyword phrase. So, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, like hiking boots, that would be considered a head term where waterproof hiking boots now starts into the long tail kind of a phrase, three, four, five, six words. So what you're looking at here, and I don't know if you're going to be able to, there we go, if you can see my cursor. But uh, this was a study done uh, last year, and it's talking about click-through rate comparing short phrases to long tail phrases. And what you're seeing up here in red, the 32 percent, oh, I'm sorry, let me show you the bottom. The bottom here is the first through tenth position in the Google search results, okay? So what this is saying is that if somebody does actually search for, uh, I'll just stick with hiking boots, hiking boots, 32% um, of them are going to click on the first search result, but it drops off where only 5% of the people who did that search are clicking on the second result right here, and it drops all the way to, you know, it's below 1%. It calculates out to zero for the sixth, seventh. You know, so to those of you that are really proud for being maybe in the ninth position for a short phrase and wondering why you aren't getting a whole lot of traffic from it, this is why. All right, and all of us can, again, relate to this. I mean, just, again, think about how you use search. If I was to go to Google and I was going to buy a pair of boots, and uh, hiking boots, and I wanted waterproof hiking boots, if I go to Google and I type in boots, I'm going to get all sorts of search results that, that, that show up that are meaningless to me. You know, they're not focused on what I want, and basically I'm going to go, oh my gosh, why did I do that? That was stupid. And that is why the red numbers don't even total to 100%, because so many people just back up or immediately add words to their searches. But once they start to do that, that's what this green line indicates. And you can imagine more clicks are happening in multiple searches or in multiple positions in Google. Because if I type in waterproof hiking boots, now I'm going to get a bunch of results that look relevant to me because I'm going to probably see that phrase highlighted like you saw on one of my slides, highlighted in Google, the word waterproof hiking boots. And I'm going to start to click around because I'm starting to get closer to the kind of information I'm looking for and I'm, I'm, I'm narrowing it down. So now 25% of us are going to click on the first result. 
and 14% on the second, and so on and so forth. So statistically, you're actually better off being in the seventh position for a long-term phrase, long-tail phrase, as compared to the second position for a short-tail phrase. So when you're thinking about your videos and your white papers and uh, your uh, pricing uh, page and all the stuff that I just went through quickly in 30 minutes, the different kinds of content, make sure you're thinking about the title and optimizing your page for the long tail. And then put together your plan, start producing content, and keep producing and keep producing quality content. And you'll soon find you're appearing all over the web as, as people are starting to do long tail searches. So I'm Arnie Ken, and I approve this message. Thank you so much, Arnie. Uh, we have to a few minutes for, for some questions with uh, the audience. Uh, if you can use your chat applet to enter your questions or in Twitter with hashtag VMWebinar. Uh, one of our first questions, we've got a few here. Um, should we have a blog? Well, yes. <laughs> um, you, you absolutely should have a blog, and I usually, I, I sometimes have a slide that will talk about the reasons for it. Um, you want a blog, and you want a blog on your domain, on the same domain as your website. Um, I know so many people set them up separately, but uh, it has been proven that if you put a blog on your domain and then actively blog, and actively could be once or twice a week if, if that's possible, um, you will get more traffic. Uh, you will get more backlinks to your website. And this is all statistical. Uh, and you'll get more mentions on Twitter and so on and so forth. Um, and all of that goes to helping uh, improve the authority of your entire domain. Every link that's coming to your site from a good quality website helps your entire website. Um, and also, the blog just gives you a great, easy way to, to post all the various content that I, that I just went through in, in the last half hour. Our next question is, um, people talk about the phrase or the term content thickening. Can you explain what that is and how they can apply it? Sure. Uh, good question. Um, so thick, uh, thickening, of course, is the op uh, opposite of thin. And you'll see Google talk a lot about, uh, in the last few months, their algorithm updates are really um, degrading what they were they call thin content and, and, and an example of thin content might be uh, if you are a uh, realtor in Arizona which is where we are and so you build out these pages uh, for all the different locales around Phoenix uh, so you might have a, a you know a, a Scottsdale real a real estate page and a Tempe real estate page and a Phoenix real estate page and it's you know just a few couple hundred words most of the words on every on each of those pages are the same, and all you've really done is change Scottsdale to Tempe, Scottsdale to Phoenix, so on and so forth. That would be viewed as thin content. You see it a lot on e-commerce sites as well, where where they've got hundreds or thousands of products, and it's just a, it's a pretty big effort, of course, to put a really good description and image and all that on those pages. So when we talk to somebody about thickening it, um, that what we're talking about is now going back and adding original, unique content to each of those pages generally adding more text. We might talk about adding images, could add video, you might add a map if it's a local uh, application. So you start to build out a page that just where that, in t that single page becomes valuable to that person who's searching for a Scottsdale realtor or searching for whatever uh, uh, product might be on your e-commerce page. And, and you know, of course, Amazon and Zappos are some of the very best examples. Just go look what they do on a product page, and that will be uh, thick content. OK. Uh, well, we want to stick to our 30-minute uh, time slot here. We're on a couple minutes over. But so we want to thank everybody for your questions. Um, and joining us for the vertical, and the vertical measures team for this webinar. Uh, we would like to invite you to mark your calendars for our next webinar, which will be on Thursday, July 12th. Uh, we will have a special guest speaker, Brian Clark. He is the founder of Copy Blogger and the CEO of Copy Blogger Media, the editor-in-chief of e uh, Entreproducer, and a contributor to uh, Forbes. We're very excited for his presentation. We'll be sending out some more information shortly to invite you to that webinar. Um, again, we will be posting the uh, video within the next uh, 24 hours for you to review, and we'll be following up with any questions we didn't have an opportunity to get to. I'm Angela Miller with Vertical Measures, and thank you very much for your time. Have a great day.